Okay, so I'm going to tell you what I know about hydrogen. Uh, I work for Northwest Capital. That's essentially a family, three family offices. We behave like a, a weird private equity fund. And what we do is things that we think are technically complicated. And if they're technically complicated enough, then the big money doesn't want to do them because they see it as too risky and that we think we can understand those risks. So then we can step in and try and do some of those things. So typically, anything we do has technical complexity to it because that keeps all the competition away. And so I'm going to tell you about hydrogen. That's global hydrogen production right now. And those little things you can't see are the renewable portions of it. So everybody talks about how fast this is all going to happen. That's that's the uh, diesel locomotive. That was the first one we had in North America. It was in 1936. And we didn't take the last steam locomotive off the railway until about 55. So when you're trying to change these big systems, it takes a long time. These are the problems I see with hydrogen. First one is safety. And so this slide with the red arrow there, if you, if you look at what, where methane and propane are explosive, it's a pretty small range. You know, you can control that. If you have a natural gas leak in your house, you might smell it. You can just go down and shut off the valve. There's no, there's no such thing as a hydrogen leak like that. If you have a hydrogen leak, it's followed by an explosion and a fire. You can find where the hydrogen leaks were by looking around for the fire. So it's really tough stuff to deal with. The second thing is, if you go to the green thing, everybody talks about the energy intensity of hydrogen. So it looks like a really dense energy carrier. You know, it's 120 and gasoline's 43. That's pretty good. But when you look at the yellow one on the left, it means hydrogen is really big. So a kilogram of hydrogen is really, really big. I have to compress it to enormous pressures to be able to move it around and handle it. And that's the thing on the, on the bottom there, that red bar. Your furnace in your house runs at 0 .006 bar. They're talking about hydrogen moving around at 700 bar. That's seven, you know, 700 bar. That's a big deal. That's what you can think of. If you're in the consumer world, think of it first because if you have a leak, it's going to catch on fire. So as far as I'm concerned, the only uses for hydrogen that I'm going to see while well, the time I'm still working are industrial uses where you have industrial safety procedures and you have people that are used to handling really dangerous things. People are talking about service stations. Maybe you can do that. I, you know, I won't be having my house beside one of those service stations. <laughs> so why is hydrogen as a fuel tub? Some people are talking about putting 10% in the, in the existing natural gas system. And, the, and you can do that, and the explosion problems aren't existing at 10%. But when you think about putting hydrogen in, you have to remember natural gas is 1,000 BTUs per cubic foot. Hydrogen is 300. So when I put hydrogen in a natural gas system, I make the whole system smaller. It's going to transmit less gas. Around. And the second thing is, if I put 10% hydrogen in, I'm only making a 3% difference in the carbon intensity of the fuel. So I'm not doing very much until I get up to really high ratios of hydrogen. Cost, it's really expensive to make hydrogen. You know, it needs a lot of equipment. And now we're saying you have to, you know, on the left there, that's CO2 taxes on the blue hydrogen that, that we make today with steam methane reformers. So it's about the same cost with carbon capture to make, uh, to make it today, either pay the taxes or you capture the carbon. But the tax environment that exists today means that we will be putting, we will retrofit all the steam methane reformers we have with some kind of carbon capture. Electrolysis is super expensive. I don't know how you ever get that to work, but maybe somebody can, but not in the world that we live in. Sorry to be so negative. I sound like one of those guys on the Muppets. <laughs> so anyway, we started a business called Hydrogen Naturally, and you know, you wonder why I got this smoky burning thing. That's our feed stuff. That's the stuff we're going to put in the machine that we're making. So we teamed up with the Peak Renewables. They're a, a substantial forestry operation. They understand wood, and we understand how to make wood into the things that we're going to make. So this is stuff that I've done. We always work on you know decent scale engineering projects. We never, we start with a clean sheet of paper, design something, and then we figure out how to finance it. We see finance and tax as just another branch of engineering. It's got a number in it, we can figure it out, so it doesn't matter uh, what it is. And these are just things we've owned over the years. Two on private stuff are the sturgeon refinery. I started that with a, from a flow sheet, and the bottom one is the Alberta Carbon Trump line that we, we built that from scratch. So everybody knows CO2 is a big problem. This is sort of my analogy. If you think of the atmosphere as a bathtub and you think, well, we're still putting CO2 in, and when's it going to overflow? And it turns out it's going to overflow pretty soon. We can't stop fast enough to stop the bathtub from overflowing. 
so if you believe this is a curve and says how fast do you have to reduce our emissions to be able to meet the two degree rule or two degree goal and you can see that the curve's getting now pretty low vertical what it means is i have to stop you know can't drive my car anymore can't heat my house can't have any electricity because i can't stop fast enough if i'm going to meet that goal so i don't believe in the tooth fairy and i think that's just you know not really good, good to have <clears throat> this is the global carbon cycle and so we're uh, there's a lot of focus on the left hand side where we got the six we think there should be more focus where the 58 is because all of these plants that are lying around either being burned or rotting are essentially returning carbon to the atmosphere so that's where we're spending our time uh, people don't know what 400 parts per million is so you know you talk about here all the stuff what's 400 parts per million so that's me putting a half a teaspoon of uh, milk into a liter of water that's 400 parts per million that's what it looks like when you get it mixed in there. And when you see that, you're thinking, wow, that's going to be hard to get out of there. That's that's not very easy. So trees have been doing this for 250 million years. They're an air capture machine. They take the CO2 in the air and they concentrate it in carbon in the tree. So they go from 400 parts per million in the air to 500,000 parts per million of carbon in the tree. We think that's a good head start if you're trying to get the carbon out of the air. So what we do with that now is we squander this opportunity. So people, you know, when we when we cut down a forest for lumber, about half of the half of the wood fiber in there either that is left behind or turns into sawdust or turns into slabs. So all of that is feedstock, and it's all got the carbon from the air in it. So this is a plan. You take that stuff, you put it in a plant like we built before, you sequester the carbon, and you get hydrogen out of it. And the places where we think hydrogen can go are the electricity market. We think we can burn it in a gas turbine. We think it can go to a pneumonia plant to make fertilizer. And we think that you can, you can have various other industries that need hydrogen to, you know, to operate like a refinery. Uh, that's, that's the last thing I built. So that's a sturgeon refinery. It cost about $10.5 billion to, to do. Uh, <clears throat> it's got the world's largest blue hydrogen plant in it. We didn't know it was a blue hydrogen plant. We just thought it was a hydrogen plant when we built it. We wanted to use the CO2 for real water, so we captured it. So we didn't know that. Uh, when we started it up after spending, uh, what, $10.5 billion, it didn't work. And the part that didn't work was the gasifier, and that's where the CO2 and the hydrogen come from. So we, we fooled around for a while, and we figured, we got to figure out how to fix this thing, because I either have to move to California and change my name or <laughs> get the thing working. <laughs> so we got it going in the end. So that, those are the CCS stuff that me and my partners have done over the, uh, the last 20 years. So anything to do with CCS in Canada, except for Shell and Boundary Dam, we've been there probably as an originator. We funded them all when they started up. And so we think we know a lot about CO2. Over, over the life of these things, I think we'll put about a gigaton in the ground from the stuff that we built. So that's CO2 coming out of a pipe. I, I, some people don't like that slide, it's, <laughs> but I liked it because it took a long time to get it done. And that was our concept for the, for the CO2 system when we had it. So we built the red part, and the red part cost about $1.1 billion, and we got a grant from the government to offsize it. So it's 10 times larger than its current flow through it. And uh, so we spent about $1.1 billion, and we got about a $400 million grant to build it. Uh, so we're planning on building these things. We call them hubs, natural air capture hubs. So the trees take the CO2 out of the air. We take the scrap wood that's left. We don't use any wood that would end up in the lumber system. We're using things that are left behind in the forest. We take that stuff, put it in a gasifier, essentially, make hydrogen and make pure CO2 for sequestration. So that's the carbon intensity of all the different colors of hydrogen you heard about. So grays on the left made from natural gas, no carbon capture. If we, car if we capture the carbon, we get blue. People are talking about green hydrogen from an electrolyzer. I take water and electricity and I can make hydrogen. We're on the right, we're negative. We're not zero, we're negative because that carbon in the tree ends up going underground. So we think you're gonna build at least three or four of these things in North America. We think there's speed stock for about 40 of them, but we think we're gonna build, you know, I'm getting kind of old, so I'm hoping to build three of them before I'm done. And you know these are operations where the circles on there are the economic distance that you can transport fiber to the plant. And so we bring we have a central location and bring fiber to the plant by rail. Uh, this is the feedstock supply. So you know we can build 40 of these things in North America and not run out of feedstock. 
and we're concentrating only on the right-hand side there, so we're not touching any of the other stuff. We're in the garbage business. Uh, we're going to build the first one in the heartland because we know everybody there, and we built stuff there before. So and there's a functioning CCS system. So one of the big thing, big advantages of Alberta, that Alberta has over everywhere else is we know how to deal with CO2, and we got a place that's working today. Everybody's talking about you know, all these hubs and stuff, but it takes a long time to do this. When I start, I started with a CCS system here in 2004, and it started functioning in 2018. So these are not easy to build. It takes a while. And there's probably people that can do it way faster and way better than me, but it takes a while to do it. It's just that kind of project. So planning on building, one thing we learned on refinery was mm -hmm. don't <coughs> build these giant mega projects. You, no one can control the cost. I believe that at the end of it, and I've built a lot of stuff in my life. I don't think you can control the cost in something that's that big. So we decided we're going to build these planting trains. We'll build about 10 identical production trains, and we'll time them over. It'll probably take us 10 years to build it. So we'll be continuously building once we start. And this is not a science project. Like when you, We understand how this works. We can build it. <coughs> Uh, so that's my goal, five megatons a year going in the ground by 2030. That's by 2035, that's what I'm trying to do. So the real thing that Alberta has is they got all this oil and gas, they got the rock and they got you know, all the things. But the real thing that we have here is the entrepreneurial culture that allows you to do this stuff. And that it's easy to form capital here. People will believe you if you tell them a good story. So they give money to me, that's the way I look. <laughs> <laughs> so I started with this. This is the flow sheet for the refinery. And that's what it looks like today. So you can do that if you live in Alberta. There's no reason you can't do these things. So when you're building a refinery, there's a lot of support to get in the press. So when we started off on the refinery, we thought it was going to cost $6 billion. It ended up costing you ten and a half. And all these guys every day were writing something about me. You know, it's never going to work. And all the things that you could think of. It's a disaster, it's an economic problem, all this stuff. And uh, that's the way I ended up looking after all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I don't know, you probably didn't follow Barco, but he, there was a thing in the newspaper in June, he said uh, there's a $2 billion surplus. There's a $4.3 billion surplus. More than $2 billion of it came from the refinery I built. That wasn't news. All the other stuff was news when everybody's complaining about it. But when we reversed the surplus, there was no news. It's printing money right now. I put Niagara Falls in here. That's the cash flow from the goddamn. <laughs> so when you're in the world of building this stuff, you can have a hearing aid like that. Just shut it off and keep doing your work. <laughs> Alberta will make the transition happen. We've got the we've got the place where we can dominate this stuff. And people don't realize our regulatory system is an advantage here because you can still build stuff. There's rules for building it, and you can go and get a permit to do it. If you go to BC, good luck trying to build one of these things. You won't you won't be able to get out of it. You know, you won't get out of jail before you die. So we've got a regulatory system, we've got people that know how to build it, we've got an operational CCS system, and entrepreneurs. Everybody here is an entrepreneur, I think. So I think it's the best place in the world to do it. Did I run out of time? You did. <laughs> <laughs>
So I'll, I'll get into how exactly we can do that with fission, because what most people think about with nuclear is obviously big, massive plants, big cooling towers, Homer Simpson, Blinky, uh, the, the waste problem, all of that. Um, it turns out that you don't really have to do it that way. <clears throat> Where do I point? That's what I I broke it. There you go. <clears throat> so the disclaimer here, I'm kind of borrowing from a few of the technologies and companies that uh, I'm involved with as, a, as an independent consultant and uh, investor through Syzygy. Uh, all of these opportunities have cap tables open, so forward-looking, backward-looking, no promises and everything. And if you're interested in learning more, please approach me afterwards, of course. This is mostly for fun and uh, profit, hopefully, for all of us. Uh, Terrestrial, the company I was co-founder of uh, when I was inspired to do so, being in the thermal energy business in Alberta uh, 10 years ago nearly, and saw a TED talk given at uh, the old theater downtown across from uh, what's now Brookfield Place. And there was a NASA scientist talking about how he was designing moon bases and going through reams and reams of old NASA technology and IP, and he came across one that was very fascinating to him that they used to design a aircraft carrier that was nuclear powered so they could watch those rooskies from the air and the navy hadn't figured it out yet how to do it from a sub so there's a big race going on in the national labs in, in the united states at that time so after the the war was won but nuclear power was really starting to be explored for the first time it was like the auto industry boom there was hundreds of variants of designs and the labs were getting tons of money to research all of them at once and politics ended up winning in the end in the sense the, the Rickover based naval project to get the submarines powered with nukes was first and they took the version of that reactor and put it on land and that's what we see. So that's your light water reactor, that's your boiling water reactor, that's your Chernobyl, Fukushima, Three Mile Island, everything. And the kind of rival in that race to Rick Over was Alvin Weinberg. And he invented the salt-based reactor and said, there's no way in hell we should be putting one of these uh, submarine reactors on land and beaching it, is what they called it, for civilians to use. It's a great technology. It's one of the safest technologies we have for energy production by a lot, even with the react uh, accidents we've had. But there's better ways to do it still. So what Terrestrial did is it blew the dust off of one of those old designs and the salt design and decided to bring it to market. And so we've been at it for 12 years now. We're one of the most advanced kind of from nothing Gen 4 vendors on the planet and certainly in Canada. We're trying to get commercial this decade and are pretty darn close. Um, we were second place on the most recent sort of uh, contest that OPG, Ontario Power Generation, held to place a small modular reactor in uh, their Darlington site in Ontario. Uh, we're backed by governments, we're backed by private, and uh, now we have MOUs even with the province of Alberta. We're funded, we're just looking for dance partners. So developers that want to write offtake agreements, uh, that's all we really need, we'll do the rest. Um, so what is the difference between these, these variants? What, what causes, um, I guess, the technology to branch one way or the other? Well, mostly it's what kind of fuel are you gonna use? Do you wanna use solid or do you wanna use liquid? Solid is what we're used to, the fuel pellets, the fuel rods, that's what we all see, that's what ends up sitting in the dry casks on the surface. But depending on these decisions you make, you can branch down all these different ways. We went down the liquid path. Next, you've got this burner versus breeder decision because obviously there's lots of uranium around, but not all of it is fissile. Fissile means it gives off that neutron that causes the chain reaction and just creates the heat in the first place. So the billiard ball reaction that we're all used to thinking about. Um, that's the fissile stuff. That's what gets separated and concentrated and enriched. Fertile elements are ones that can accept 
those neutrons and then keep reacting. And the, the very successful Canadian CANDU program ended up being a really amazing story. Don't have time to get into it today, but we've, we've essentially got a technology on our hands and a legacy on our hands in Canada that is peaceful. It uses non-enriched fuel for the most part and the, the waste that it produced, the spent fuel, is really only 3% of the available energy in that fuel is accessed and utilized. So all that waste that's sitting around is literal treasure, it's future fuel, and what we can do is access that by going down the path uh, of liquid. And that's what we're doing with terrestrial. So we choose liquid, we choose burner, we choose salt as our coolant, and that's our molten salt reactor. We call ourselves an IMSR because all of the nasty stuff is integral to the core unit. Everything that can possibly have radiation contacted or had a leak is all inside of this nice little hot tub that we see here. That's what it looks like at cross-sectional view. So there's the, the tub, we've got our primary heat exchangers, some pumps, and the salt and the fuel actually sit all inside of this. So we load it up, we'll top it up a little bit after uh, some operation, and after about seven years of operation, we put it into a dormant state where it will sit and the decay heat will remove and essentially we've got our plant set up to pop another one in beside this one while it's cooling down and so on and so forth. So the plant itself can run indefinitely so long as you're replacing it with new core units. And that speaks to the concept of modularity, right? It's small, it's modular, you're making it in a factory, and you're making investment decisions to continue or not throughout the, the life of the project. What can you use it for? Why is it, why is it different? So what's cool about salt, why we chose that? It's an entirely different safety case from what you're used to seeing in nuclear <coughs> Uh, where you're dealing with very high pressure steam, you're dealing with steam that's made direct contact with the uh, radioactive fuels, and we just felt that there's a better way to do that. So what we make is heat, first and foremost. We'll make steam that's 650 degrees Celsius. Um, I love that as a thermal guy because we had to make steam very much like that to pump it down long branches to get to my well pads, and still have, it have somewhat amount of energy. Yeah, it wasn't steam when it got there all the time. It was kind of sluggy stuff, but it was still hot. And if you could throw it down the hole, it was enough to mobilize that bitumen and get it produced back to the site. And that's where I saw the obvious connection when I first learned about a high temperature molten salt reactor. So if we're doing the radiation dance here in the core unit, You've got a secondary salt loop that's taking the heat out of that heat exchanger and taking it across this in what we're calling the industrial salt loop. These are solar salts, they're nitrate salts. You can pump these five kilometers and they retain their heat. So you don't have to be really co-located. It's just sort of friendly for the way uh, an industrial complex can <coughs> expand on itself over time. And what we're really looking to do with this is supply that heat to power generation use, grid services, but specifically processing. Because a lot of the conversation that's going on nowadays, every, everybody knows the hockey stick chart, they know carbon, they know that problem, and we're talking about decarbonizing, decarbonizing power, but we're only talking about the electricity sector. Electricity is a fraction of the energy we use. Uh, it powers a lot of what we do, don't get me wrong. It's a, it's a great thing to focus on, we all know a lot about it. We, most of us have some contact with it. But think about all the stuff that's around us. Anything that's physical, uh, material, uh, a molecule, anything you ingest, that's process heat driven. It's created by consuming a lot of heat and most of it is, is done by either burning natural gas or coal. And, prior to that point, especially at scale. So Alberta is really, really, I guess, notorious for this. And there's a reason why we kept getting picked on as the bad kid in the family, just because we're doing what we need to do to chip in to the family and what we need for the country. Uh, most of our emissions in Canada 
come from burning steam to generate or burning gas to generate steam to produce our oil exports. So I'll just jump ahead. Hydrogen market is massive. It's, it's here in Alberta, Ian laid on the map in North America, you could build several hubs and it's multi-billion dollar market. So our heat can go on to produce from methane or water or any other feedstock. We've got hydrogen. And then past that, the point of this is saying uh, hydrogen typically gets made at two bucks a kilogram right now through steam methane reforming, and we're right there, which is pretty shocking to most people. It's equivalent to an in furnace gas price of about six dollars a, a million thermal unit. Skip through that, and H2 goes to ammonia, it goes to methanol, it's feedstock to most of our major consumption products. And here's the value of a, of a typical project. So what does it cost to build? That's one of the biggest questions. So some of the people that are looking to buy our reactor and put it in the middle of their plant, to build the entire plant with the reactor, they're looking at about five billion US overnight. And you know, they, they've got a pretty, pretty decent investment profile in this. And that's why we're getting a lot of attention as terrestrial um, wanting to be integrated with, with some of these things. So point uh, being for as cheap as gas, no carbon emissions, and it can be cited. Very, very good safety case because we're not dealing at pressure, it's all atmospheric. And uh, we want to basically enable entrepreneurs like Ian who are coming up with these really amazing, brilliant concepts and leveraging the infrastructure that they're putting in place and taking it from the 10% of it that they're using and using all of it and then putting the demand in place to maybe build some more and keep going. Because the transition will not happen overnight. We need contributions from all of these solutions and we're really excited to figure out how we can do that together. Well, that's it. Awesome, thank you Chris.